It was an agreeable surprise for the emperor to find himself so neatly lodged. He had never been so comfortable since he had been at St. Helena. Whoever sees my room will think it belongs to a dainty lady. Formerly, little things had not attracted his attention, but it longed with the simplest, most ordinary things were objects of curiosity for him. Sometimes before Madame de Montalon left, the governor had begun to build the new house, which was situated some 60 yards from that of the Grand Marshal. Since then, the work had been pushed forward very actively under the supervision and direction of the engineer officers. All the men were available, had been requisitioned, soldiers, workmen, Chinese slaves, each one according to what he knew how to do. Every day the road to Longwood had been covered with trains of men and carts carrying stone, wood, iron, lead, in short, everything necessary for a good-sized building. All these things had come from England, as the island could hardly furnish anything more than rubble stone, and in order to obtain this more cheaply, they had pulled down most of the dry stone walls about Longwood. At the time the priests arrived, the house was already well advanced, in fact, almost completed. Indeed, there was nothing to do but finish the interior. Before the work was begun, the governor had sent the plan of the house and all its outbuildings to General de Montalon, that he might submit them to the emperor, who would make any changes and corrections in them which he should consider necessary but the emperor would not hear of these plans spoken of and even had the governor told that he earnestly begged him to let him alone that he napoleon did not need any house other than that in which he lived which was all that he needed for the time which was left to him to live that when the building was ready he would need nothing but a coffin it was a sort of prediction which was unhappily only too well fulfilled Chapter 15. Sir Hudson Lowe, during the whole time that the emperor had been occupied with his guards, the arrival of the priests, and the decoration of his rooms, he seemed to have forgotten his position. In fact, for that length of time, activity had driven away that anxious and thoughtful air which had marked him previously. But the English ministry and the governor, its faithful agent, were not satisfied, one may say, unless they were rattling their prisoners' chains. It was necessary to make him feel them, and even to make them heavier. A colossus, a Hercules, like General Bonaparte, ought to be loaded down till he bent under the burden. Consequently, annoyances of very sort and ill treatment of all kinds were frequently repeated. The victim only asked for quiet, and this quiet he could not have. Here is one among many of the amiable proceedings of this executioner of the Britannic oligarchy. If two or three days passed without the spies seeing the emperor, Sir Hudson Lowe would arrive at Longwood escorted by several officers of his staff and would order the orderly officer to go and walk under the prisoner's windows and to go near enough to see inside. So indelicate and dishonorable an order did not fail to fill the officer with disgust, but he had to obey under pain of dismissal. It was useless for the officer to approach the windows, for he could not see anything. The curtains were drawn. He would return to the governor and report on his walk. Sir Hudson, not satisfied, would order this same officer to put on his uniform and to present himself at the principal door of the house, which was that of the reception room, and to knock at it repeatedly. If he was not answered at first, no one would reply, this not being a room where anyone remained on duty, after knocking again and again, the officer would go away as he had come. The governor, vexed and humiliated, would order one of his officers to accompany the orderly officer to present himself at the door of the private apartments and to knock there. The door opened at the first stroke. We had our orders. Everything was arranged in advance. What did the gentleman want? asked the valet, who had opened the door and who remained outside with the officer. Where is General Bonaparte? The emperor is in his bedroom, ill. What is the matter with him? The governor must have been informed about it from the bulletins which are furnished him every day. Is he very ill? Gentlemen, there is nobody but his first valet de chambre who can tell you. He's the only person who goes into his majesty's bedroom. Tell Marchand that we would like to speak to him. He is in with the emperor now. When he leaves the general's room, be good enough to tell him to report at the guardhouse. Then the officers offered a package addressed to General Bonaparte and said to the servant, Will you hand this letter to the general? 
No, gentlemen, I cannot take it. It is not my duty to take letters which are addressed to His Majesty. If you wanted to reach him, give it to Monsieur de Montsalon or the Count Bertrand. The officers withdrew and went to join the governor, who remained a short distance from the house or at the guardhouse, and who finally decided to go to see Monsieur de Montsalon or the Grand Marshal. As soon as the officers were away from the house, the valet de chambre, who had seen in what direction they had gone, immediately went to give an account of what had happened to the emperor. As soon as the letter reached the emperor, either through Monsieur de Montsalon or the Grand Marshal, he sent it back or threw it unopened out of the window. What does he want? Let him leave me in peace. I have no need to have a correspondence with a man who takes every opportunity to insult me, whether from indisposition or ill humor or some other cause. Emperor would stay in his apartment for several days at a time and would not set foot out of doors until he was tired of his seclusion. Bad weather sometimes prevented him from going out, but he sometimes stayed in deliberately in order to see how far the governor would go. One of these scenes had irritated him so much in August 1819, before the priests arrived, that he had had his doors closed and bolted, and it had bars placed behind the shutters of his windows. He had his guns and pistols near his bed loaded, as well as his sword, his saber, and his dagger. He had sworn to stretch on the sill of his door the first person who would be bold enough to pass it. He added that no one should come into his private apartments until he, Napoleon, was a corpse. The emperor, believing that the governor was capable of anything, had thought it necessary to take all possible precautions to prevent his last asylum from being violated. Sir Hudson Lowe was the most timid and suspicious man among the English. Night and day he dreamed of nothing but the escape of his prisoner, yet he must have been very silly to think that escape was possible to a man shut up by day and in an enclosure a few thousand yards square looked down upon by mountains on which a number of points were occupied by military posts with all the avenues which communicated with the sea watched while at night the house was surrounded with sentries so close to one another that not a cat could have passed through without being seen. Were not all these obstacles sufficient to take away from the prisoner all the idea of escaping, independent of a very active watch, did Sir Hudson count for nothing? The difficulties which would have to be overcome in order to reach the sea, the paths, if there were any, were almost impracticable by day for a young and active man. What would they have been at night for one who had not the slightest acquaintance with those hills, which are furrowed with ravines, each one deeper than the other? Would the emperor have been able, heavy as he was, and unaccustomed to mountain climbing, to undertake so dangerous an enterprise, the success of which could only have been imaginary? Did the governor forget that the shores of the island are very steep or perpendicular, except in a few places. Did he further forget that Briggs were always cruising around the island day and night, that the signals kept him informed of what was happening at sea? What means, then, had Napoleon of escaping from this island? Could he swim on a plank to a continent 400 leagues away? The governor had nothing to fear but a fleet, and even that fleet would have had difficulty in making itself master of an island, which was impregnable on all sides. I do not doubt that the governor was the slave of the orders or the instructions which he received from the British ministry, but in executing them, even literally, he should have shown more kindness and gentlemanlike conduct. And if these instructions were too severe and dishonorable, he should have resigned. Such conduct in his part would have been a very honorable action, which the English nation would certainly not have disapproved.